Hi, I'm Sandy Stroud. I'm the director of the Sustainable Real Estate Development Program here at Tulane. And I want to welcome you to our campus. Thank you for coming. Um, this is the third lecture this semester. Uh, it's a joint effort between the World Trade Center of New Orleans, the uh, Master of Urban Studies and Planning at uh, UNO, and the Sustainable Design and Development Program here at Tulane. We plan to have more of these in the spring and ongoing. We enjoy this combination of topics around sustainability and globalization. So I hope you registered so you can keep hearing about our, our upcoming events. We plan, we're planning a whole series of these on the third Tuesday of every month uh, throughout the spring semester. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Thompson from UNO to introduce our speaker tonight. We've all picked speakers for this fall series, and this was her selection. So welcome, Dr. Thompson. Good evening. I'd like to again thank Sandy from Tulane University and to Dominic Knoll and his wonderful staff from the World Trade Center and of course my department, um, Department of Planning and Urban Studies at the University of New Orleans just in case UNO didn't come across. Um, but we have uh, three wonderful people here that I've known for over 10 years and you'll be able to meet Ms. May Louie, Director of Leadership and Capacity Building and Mr. Jason Webb, they have new titles, so that's why I have to read them, Director of Administration and Finance, and our featured speaker, Mr. John Barrows. And I, I want to just take a few minutes to read just a few of his accomplishments. John Barrows is a lifelong resident of the Dudley neighborhood. He became the executive director after a national search in 2000. He's been involved with DSNI, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, since he was a teenager, serving as an organizer, leader, and innovator in many ways. He was co-founder of DSNI's Nubian Roots Youth Committee and helped start important DSNI youth programs such as college mentoring and job advocacy. John is the designer of the prominent 1993 Unity Through Diversity mural. At age 17, he was the first youth elected to the DSNI Board of Directors. During 1997-98, John was elected Vice President of the DSNI Board. He also served a term as Vice President of Dudley Neighbors, Inc., the community land trust created to ensure land use control and permanent housing affordability. And you'll hear more about that this evening. John is a member of the 2005 Fellows Class of South African United States Center for Leadership and Public Values, a 2007 Bar Foundation Fellow. He serves on the Community Advisory Board of Northeastern's Race and Justice Institute and Board of the New Democracy Coalition. He was elected co-chairperson of the Center of Community Builders, a national practitioner network, he was a member of Aspen Institute's Roundtable on Community Change. John has received numerous awards, and I, I stopped there for a while, John, um, including the inaugural Community Service Awards from the Boston Day and Evening Academy, 2008, Robert Leo Ruffin Award from the Archdiocese of Boston in 2004, the Action for Boston Community Development, Roxbury Community Award in 2000. If he doesn't have enough to do, John is also the co-owner of Restaurante Cesaria, a Cape Verdean restaurant in Boston. He is a graduate of Dartmouth College and a candidate for a master's in public policy at Tufts University. John is also an active member of the Boston City School Board. It's my absolute pleasure and honor to welcome John Barrows. Thank you very much. Um, it's, I worry because with that kind of introduction, I think she's trying to uh, make up for the presentation. So uh, at least I'll have some kind of credibility up here in, in, as I talk. But um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the warm hospitality that I always receive when I come to uh, New Orleans. It's amazing. Um, it continues to amaze me, though, right? So every time I come, I always expect good food. 
but I always under-expect the hospitality, and it's always, it always meets my, uh, beats my expectation. But so what I want to do today is um, get to it so that I can quickly shut up, and then we can get into a dialogue conversation on the topic of community-driven neighborhood development. And in fact, what I want to do is do my whole presentation on this first slide, <laughs> then get into some quick details, talk about some examples, um, and then get into a conversation. And really what, I, what I'm, what I'm going to try to make the case for is two things. One, that communities, um, community-driven community -driven neighborhood development is really about community control. And it's a power, it's about, it's about a power shift. Second is that, in fact, cities can't truly serve their residents unless communities are, are empowered to partner with cities. But right? that all cities can do is cycle residents. Right? You can move some people in, some people out, depending on policy, on development. But you can't really truly serve, particularly the most vulnerable residents in a city, unless those residents are engaged in somehow in partnering, have some capacity to partner. Now, that's not always a city's fault, whether they are or not. But it should be part of our thinking and part of how we do work. And the way I'm going to do that is talk about organized community and think a little bit, using the Delhi Street story, what an organized community is, what it looks like. Accountability through community representation is what I'm going to talk about. Resident leadership development, the, importance part, the important part of that. And community collaboration, which is how we structure. And then I will talk about the important part of community being part of the planning process. That planning is not something that should happen to communities, but with communities, and that there should be collaboration in communities in order to do that. Lastly, I will go over some land use control mechanisms and tools that we use that I think is important if community is going to drive or be in control of neighborhood development. And after three hours, I'll be done, <laughs> you know, and uh, there will be some questions. Actually, yeah, so, so I, I chopped out a couple of other sections that I was going to try to talk about because part of it is I've spent too much time in New Orleans and I've got too much in my head right now. So this is the, this is the summary version of what I would like to say to you today. So let's get to it. The, um, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, when we think about sort of what a community is or how we organize our community, we are playing the role of community planner and community organizer. And we're doing it by saying that residents should be leading that process, that residents should be leading the table or the collaborative to convene other stakeholders in the neighborhood to plan for, create, and control this amazing place that they want to live in. So that's our mission. So that means we don't develop and we don't provide services. And I'll get back to this, but it's really important to think about that. We are an organizing and planning entity. And very few communities have that kind of organization playing that role. Typically, people speak on behalf of community with interest. right? And so somebody's doing housing, but they're also representing the whole community interest or someone's doing service delivery, but they're also talking about here's what the community wants, right? And so we've divorced ourselves from those activities, and that's not what we look at as bottom line. We are, from a bottom line standpoint, asking ourselves, are we empowering residents to be able to plan for, create, and control an organized community to make sure that we are moving towards their vision? And so what does our community look like? We have uh, a very diverse population. We have a community, and, and what you see on the map there is the map of our neighborhood, and all the dots are our members, all right? And so our members, and we have about 3,600 3, members in a neighborhood of about 23,000, and they're spread all over the place. And we even got some dots that are outside of the circle, outside of the, of the neighborhood, that are illegal members. <laughs> yeah. we're, because we're a place-based, in fact, because we're a place-based effort, we're very strict with membership. And we get pushback from other neighbors in, uh, in other parts of the surrounding area about how strict we are. The ethnic racial background uh, breakup in the neighborhood, 38% African American, 25% Latino, 25% Cape Verdean. Who knows what Cape Verdeans are? Very good. All right. Cape Verdean, immigrant community from West Africa. 
10 islands off the west coast, about 400 miles off the west coast of, of Senegal. 7% um, white, which is the old guard, primarily Irish and Italian, right? That used to be part of this really vibrant community. And a really important demographic number is the fact that 38%, imagine that, 38% of the 23,000 are under the age of 19. So a really young, a 19 and under, really young community. And so what does that mean for us? Well, that means if we're going to do a community effort and if we're going to be a community, then everybody's got to be at the table, right? We've got to figure out if that's what our community looks like, how do we build a structure or a neighborhood governance apparatus that keeps everybody at the table? So this is what we did. So we said, okay, we're going to make sure it's neighborhood-led, neighborhood resident-led, and that all the major groups are at the table. So we got four seats for African Americans, four seats for Latinos, four seats for Cape Verdeans, four seats for whites, three seats, and we're going to need to bump that up to four, but three seats for youth between the age of 15 to 17, because after 18 you can be on the board as an adult. Um, and let me, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about that first before we get into the institutional partners. The, we could have at some point said, we're going to do proportional seats and have people fight over who's, you know, they're only, they're only 10, 7% white in the neighborhood. How come they get four seats? You know, we could have, right? But, but that wasn't the, the issue. The issue wasn't proportionally who would represent it. It was making sure we had those voices at the table. Because what we learned very early on is people feel like their interests are represented in leadership or in an organization if they can see themselves in leadership. And it's something that's held true, and it's something that studies will say on and on and on, um, um, that this is a good way to have people feel like they're represented. And the neighborhood continues to agree that this is true. This board is elected every two years by a neighborhood-wide election process. The other members, the other stakeholders on the board, seven nonprofit agencies, and most of them are uh, nonprofit human service agencies, two small businesses, Nowadays, not so small. One small, one large. <laughs> one small, one large. Two religious organizations, two community development corporations, and then two other appointed resident seats just to make sure at the end of the day, after our, all our, our election work is over and we look at the board, if there's, sometimes if there's more women than men, we'll go find some men and get them on the board. Sometimes if we are doing more work in a certain part of the neighborhood and that's not who got elected, we'll go to appoint a couple of residents from that part of the neighborhood. So it allows us to think about representation in a different way and who's on the board and who's not. In order for us to engage 34 people from the neighborhood, resident leadership capacity building is huge. So May Louie, who uh, Dr. Thompson talked about, is our director of leadership and community capacity building and spends her time as directing the Resident Leadership Institute in doing trainings so that the residents that are engaged, whether on the board and on com or on committee work in doing community planning, have thought about it before. It's not because they're in a meeting and they're thrown up against some of the questions that they're beginning to engage, but they've thought about how you think about data, how you think about mapping, how you think about some of the trends or some of the questions that neighborhoods like, neighborhoods like us have to deal with. What is, what is our leadership development model? What's our organizing model? You know, how do we get things done? And this is our um, institute that helps us do that. And what it helps us think about is the processes and thinking tools that we need to do group decision making. Because that's a lot of the work that we do. And so visioning processes, planning techniques, scenario planning. We think about how we engage differently. A lot of what we do happens to be done in three languages, simultaneously in meetings. So you might find in a meeting like this, a translator on one side, another translator on another side, usually one in Cape Verde in Creole, the other one in Spanish, and a bunch of folks with headphones in their ears. And then when I say a joke, a part of the crowd laughs, and at 30 seconds, and then another part of the crowd laughs, right? Because there's translation happening, and translation takes time. It's really interesting when that happens. But then when you say a joke, and it translates culturally in one language, one way, and culturally in another language, the other way, a group will laugh, 30 seconds later, another group will say, ah. Uh. <laughs> All right, but anyways, okay, keep going. So, um, so we spend a lot of time on group process and community planning and building the capacity to do that. Big part of that is youth leadership. And in fact, 
the youth are a very live part of the work that we do, very active. I started as a youth volunteer at the age of 14, got involved, and you know, then we would really run campaigns to ask youth to stay involved, right? So how, how will somebody like me feel like I've got a place in that neighborhood, feel like, feel like I can go off, study, get everything done, um, and then come back and have a place in the neighborhood? And so we've done that fairly successful, successfully. And there's a lot of us, myself included, Jason, who's sitting here, um, our, our, our former board president who was just elected state representative. We have another state representative. There's a lot of us who not only have come up through DSNI and are now active civic leaders in our city, but are, are also actively leading in our neighborhood. And that's been a real part of our work and what we would argue is imperative for sustainability in this work. Leadership development, youth engagement, really critical. The, and this is all about how we define community and engage community. And, I, and, and, and these are all seeds for a conversation. But now I'm going to move to this question around community planning. So if you don't plan for your community, you better believe somebody's planning for it. Right? And sometimes the policies that come out of their planning is not really so helpful to your community. And so we find in certain, ur in certain urban um, parts of our cities, that there are cycles that have happened that have pushed people out, disinvested in part of the cities, and that's what we found ourselves in in the early 80s. We found ourselves being a consequence of some bad policies after World War II and the federal mortgage practices. You know, um, our neighborhood became more poor and more immigrant. There was a huge migration from the south and an influx of immigrant communities from both the Caribbean and out Africa that changed the complexity of that neighborhood. And so we started to lose some of the patronage jobs and some of the connections to the city because we weren't at that time Irish and connected to the old school Boston. And Boston is very parochial, very separate, and we, couldn't, we didn't have the same influence. Financial institutions literally redlined our neighborhood. Map, redline around the neighborhood and made the decision that they wouldn't lend money there. And so we were close to the capital markets and really couldn't and people in that neighborhood couldn't lend money and couldn't eventually sell homes. And so what happened was there was abandonment and disinvestment and those who owned homes and wanted to leave the neighborhood in the white flight to the suburbs were burning down their homes in order to collect from the insurance policies. I remember we lost families. My mother often talks about her good friend who, and uh, she died in a fire and all her five kids died as well. And it was a real tragic moment in the history of our neighborhood. And what ended up happening was we ended up with a neighborhood that had a lot of vacant land. And it wasn't a natural disaster, but it was a man-made disaster. And in some ways, with a lot more scars, and people used to come and dump in our neighborhood. We had a lot of abandoned buildings that weren't doing anything. We had so many that um, people started using them for things, like trash management waste sites, right? So you'd walk home and there'd be sides of beef on the sidewalk, right? Because we also abutted a light industrial area and that's how they manage their trash in our neighborhood. Disproportionate number of brownfields, while at the same time being placed in a very um, advantageous location citywide, geographically. A lot of abandoned, abandoned lots, a lot of empty lots, a lot of abandoned buildings in a city that was growing, in a city that was looking for a bigger footprint around the neighborhoods, right? Meaning the downtown part of the city. And so we quickly came together to create our own vision about what, the, what we, our neighborhood should look like because we heard the city had started planning around us. And the city had actually at that point introduced a plan for some hotels and some other things in an, in an area nearby, in a Dudley Square area. And so we said, oh, wait a minute. We've got to do something. We've got to come around, under our, uh, around our own plan. And so our plan became a comprehensive plan that had a vision for a vibrant urban village. And our vibrant urban village was calling for physical redevelopment, physical revitalization, economic development, human development and social development. 
And the planning process was really extensive. And we, we actually well, created a, a number of different plans. Most importantly, in 1989, we published what was a master plan for the area, and the city rezoned the whole area according to our master plan. The city actually adopted it, and there were some other agreements that came afterwards that I'll talk about. But for now, in terms of planning, we've used all types of creative tools to engage residents. And this is a, flow, a phone block that allowed us to look at density. And you can't see it from this picture, but we, it allowed us to add layers onto the buildings and begin to add buildings onto blocks. And it was actually something created by some uh, planning students at MIT. Um, and very friendly tools. And so you know, we, we, we created tools that you didn't have to read to plan, that you didn't have to understand the language to plan. But if you can come to the meetings, and if you can engage with us, we'd probably give you a crayon and a white sheet. We'd probably give you some blocks, and we'd probably um, give you some data, and we'd let you go at it so that you can help plan with us. Very, very helpful tools. But what ends up happening is the community plans for everything. Well, everything in our neighborhood, very comprehensive. So every once in a while, we'll take stock. And in 2001, in fact, we took stock, and the community was asking for a number of different things under these 14 items. And so sometimes in neighborhoods, the planning process needs to be about systems thinking. And it needs to be about how do you make sure you're addressing all 14 items, and that's the question we asked ourselves at that time, by selecting drivers, things that if we worked on would drive the other 14. And when we figured out that in the 14, there were seven drivers, and that we could group them in three strategic focus areas at DS9 that we would pay attention to. Very important part of comprehensive planning is the decision-making process for sequencing, for prioritizing, and making decisions. That kind of sequencing and prioritizing has us doing crazy things in the neighborhood. OK, innovative things in the neighborhood. Um, but one of the things it's helped us to do is to say to ourselves, how do we know all of the activities are amounting to anything in our whole neighborhood? Right? So one of the critiques for place-based change efforts like ours is that the measurement tools and reports can show that the people who come through our programs are doing well, but they can't show that we're, in fact, improving the whole neighborhood. Right? And so what we've adopted is a model that basically says what's the most, the, that we think the most important, the most dependent part of our community's ecology are children. And that if the children are doing well, then the neighborhoods has to, has to be doing well. Families have to be somewhat healthy and strong. Local businesses have to be providing the right foods and the right kinds of services. The, the schools have to be doing well. Health care has to be provided, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Housing has to be stable. And so we've adopted um, child outcome, a child outcomes framework under the um, strategies that still have uh, economic development, physical development, social development, and human development, all moving towards about 20 neighborhood level, population level indicators in our neighborhood. And this leads us to open, in 2012, our new charter school. Um, and um, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a picture that illustrates the kind of decisions we make in our planning process and why and how we got to this charter school. I'm now going to move from community planning to land use control tools. Because what's happened is once we plan, we're usually trying to implement things but wanting to have influence and control how they, about how they're used and how they are kept in our neighborhood. And so what we learned very early on is if you plan for a beautiful neighborhood and you try to implement a beautiful neighborhood, you'll quickly price yourself out of that beautiful neighborhood, right? And so residents called for development without displacement. We want to make this, and it was interesting. I was having a conversation with a young lady today who said to me, during all the planning processes in New Orleans, we would kind of go to these meetings, and we knew what we wanted, but we wouldn't ask for it all. Because we were scared if we actually got it all, that we couldn't afford to be in our neighborhood anymore. And it was just a real sad statement, but it's true. And in fact, when we, really, when we really started to vision early on and we started talking about what kind of neighborhood we wanted, people said the same thing. They said, if we get that kind of a neighborhood, if we have that kind of a community center in our neighborhood, we have those kind of schools, we have those kind of businesses, we have those kind of parks, that's not our neighborhood. Our neighborhoods don't look like that. They look like vacant lots. They look like dilapidated buildings. They, you know, so high crime. Right? Those are the neighborhoods we live in. And so it's a really, it's a really you know, 
um, contradictory piece to be talking about improving your neighborhood for someone else. So development without displacement is really important in the work of community-driven neighborhood development. And what we did was figure out how to create tools for that that I'm going to talk about. But first, I'm going to talk about the first area we planned for and then how the tools came about. This triangle is right in the middle of our neighborhood. See that black triangle there? Yes. Thank you. Black Triangle is right in the heart of our neighborhood and is the place that was most devastated. And so all of the black shaded areas of that map are vacant lots. And so in the 64 acre uh, site, 30 acres were vacant. 15 of those acres owned by the city at that point and then another 15 privately owned. In that 15 acres, there were 181 parcels, 131 owners. And when we started contacting them, most of them would say, what? I own what? Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My father, that was a house he owned, but it burnt down. And I didn't know I inherited that. And so it was a really tricky conversation to have with all those owners to try to assemble those lots to do anything with it. And so the, the question was, how do we begin to assemble that and package it in a way that we can develop our neighborhood again? And we've decided that we would do a number of different things. And these are some tools we came up with. That planning for that site and what was going to happen there in a very public way was the most important thing we can do. And getting the city to buy into that plan was the most advantageous thing we did. And when they bought into that plan, they rezoned that whole area, as I said before, to our plan. So block by block, we got the zoning we needed. If you can rezone an area, that's a plus for development, right? Because as we know, it costs developers money to go through the zoning process. And then we said, wow, 181 parcels, 131 owners. How are we going to get everybody to the table? Let's use eminent domain authority. So in fact, we're the only nonprofit, I think, throughout the country today that's, that's used or that has eminent domain authority over a certain part of its neighborhood. And we effectively use eminent domain authority. It was challenged four times in court, one on four, um, because we were able to, to prove blight. And then we were able to prove that we went through an extensive process to engage those owners in mitigating blight. And they chose not to. Um, and there were a couple of other legal things that we had to prove, but we proved what we needed to prove, use authority, and move the neighborhood forward. But I think even more important than eminent domain authority was a land disposition agreement with the city about what would happen there if, um, I'm sorry, about what would happen around this area in our whole neighborhood. That if there were any other city lots that were being disposed of while we were doing this project, that there would be a clear step for community uh, planning process for our involvement and that it would meet our standards after that and that the city would issue the land according to what we said. And it was really, really important agreement so that while we were doing this, the rest of the neighborhood wasn't changing us around us. And then the tool that we used, in fact, to make sure after we created this amazing neighborhood that it would remain affordable to residents in our neighborhood was the Community Land Trust. And that's what I want to actually spend a little time on today, is the Community Land Trust. The Community Land Trust is a tool that allows you to create shared, it's a shared equity model that allows you to create both wealth for the family and the community. And this is my quick version of what a Community Land Trust is. The big arrow, read with me, family, the family owns a house. So, you know, somebody comes in and buys a house. And the other green arrow says? Community owns the land. And what bonds that relationship is a lease, right? So it allows us to be a partner in home ownership. And it also allows us to steward the land in a very close way. So you can imagine if we're part of every home, when the predatory lenders came by and asked to milk the equity out of these homes, what do we say? No. Right, zero foreclosures during that period on our land trust. None of our homeowners lost their home. And in fact, all of our homeowners during the bust have equity that outpaced the market because there is a strict formula on our land trust that says what the equity will be, right? It's because we're sharing it. So the owner gets some, the community gets some of that equity. And so there's equity built in on the land. So in fact, we can probably track about four to $5 million in equity 
that we've built in the community because subsidy that originally went into the houses like these were kept in the house. What does that mean? That means that this house probably cost us, Mr. Webb, about $325,000. About $325,000 to build. We brought in about $150,000 of subsidy. Took it down to about 175 to 85 of those homes. And 185 and the rest of that subsidy stays in that agreement with the land trust so that when people, there is a modest equity increase, but when people come to, when they are reselling those homes and someone else comes to buy it, that it's still at an affordable rate. But we incentivize people to improve their homes because we will capture 100% of improvements in the resale formula, right? You fix your kitchen and your new sink and countertop and cabinets cost you $5,000 we will put that right back in your resale formula at cost. No depreciation, you know, um, no replacement, you know, just at cost, right? And so it really incentivizes people to make improvements in their homes because they know they can get it back at resale. We also say if, that, if the market is not ready to buy it, we will buy the homes for you, right? So we, we know we have demand. We have a waiting list of demand for these homes, but we will buy it, right? We have a waiting list we have a waiting list that's so strong that in, in 2009, when the city ran out of subsidy money for these types of projects, and they had a little bit left, we were the only project in the entire state of Massachusetts to receive subsidy to do affordable housing, right? And sold them all, right? Because we not only build homes, we build community. So people don't want to live, us, live, live in our neighborhood only because there might be a nice house that they help to design, but also because they know their neighbors because they feel safer, because they feel more ownership. They feel like it's a place that values them, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why people buy homes in places, not just because it's a deal, but because you actually think it's a place you want to have your family in or you want to be in or you want to come to at night. So what else is on our land trust? Well, we acquired all 32 acres as of, um, Last year, we acquired all, all 32 acres of land that we talked about on that original master plan for uh, the Dudley Triangle. And on the 32 acres, we have 70, 78 units of permanently affordable home ownership, simple fee home ownership. 95. 95. Stand corrected. 95 units of simple fee home ownership. Now we'll change that. 78 co cooperative housing, so there's double protection and 52 rental units, playgrounds, a mini orchard and garden, a 10,000 square feet community greenhouse, community nonprofit office space, and about 40 plus thousand square feet of affordable commercial space so that we can rebuild our neighborhood. I'm gonna quickly give some examples. This is a, the greenhouse in our, neighbor, in our neighborhood. It's the Dudley, the Dudley we're, we own the greenhouse it's, it's a 10,000 square feet uh, facility that I talked about. There are areas in the greenhouse where we do community growing, so there are beds for residents to come in and grow. And amazing stories about parents, like this, this one um, father and son combination that grows together. This one uh, father, son, um, uh, mother combination. That, I mean, just amazing. And then, you know, you have that food on your table, you help cook it, and you talk about it. I mean, so just, some real community building stories. And then another part of the, 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 the greenhouse is for local commercial food production so that we can actually help push the food agenda forward around organic local food, fresh foods for people um, to buy in our restaurants or in our local grocery stores. The other thing we can do with our greenhouse is talk about you know, sort of nonprofit office space. And this is a building, it was the first Silver Lead certified building in Roxbury in our neighborhood. Um, it, uh, it is operated by Project Hope, which is an organization that does amazing work, amazing work empowering families, particularly families that are either in threat of being homeless or homeless, to move them out of poverty. And they've just, they just have an, an amazing track record. And that's the kind of thing we want to protect in our neighborhood. And so we, the land trust has a relationship there to keep that there. That's what happens when the sideshow ends. So. I thought I had one more slide, but I don't, um, and that's okay. So the land trust allows us then to uh, 
to not only implement the plan that we've planned for, so we drive improvement in our neighborhood, but to control and continue to influence other development around our neighborhood, right? So one of the things we did beyond the land trust work was we actually helped to plan out another 800 units of market rate housing in the neighborhood. So exactly what we thought would happen, happened. We started to plan and improve the neighborhood and quickly the market followed. And so people have wanted to come in the neighborhood and so we quickly then underpinned that process with the community voice process and all the stuff that was happening, 800 units of housing was built. When we, when we first talked about our master plan, and this is the last point I'll make and then open it up for, for Q&A. When we first talked about our neighborhood, we talked about creating a mixed income neighborhood. And so we thought on our land trust we'd create a third low income, 80% 80, 80 median and under, a third mo moderate, about 120% to 80, and then a third market. And the market has taken care of itself. It just outpaced us, really. And we've done a lot, really, with low income. But we, what we really have missed out on, and we've got to really think about, and we're going to continue to think about creatively, is the moderate. How do people like me come in and afford, you know, young professionals come in and afford to live in our neighborhood? And that's the, that's the kind of question that we need to continue to ask as we build out our neighborhood and have the kind of protections over those houses that we need to make sure that we have the right stock of housing in our neighborhood.